Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Director of Sales, Azure, Jim McGuire. How's everybody doing today? No, no really. How is everybody doing today? All right, we've got to make sure you're awake uh, to start this thing off. Uh, if you're like me, you woke up this morning, you looked outside, and the rain had subsided, the flooding had subsided, and you said, I can leave the rowboat at home today. This is a good day. Um, however, the weather this week has been pretty appropriate because most of the speakers that we have for this session are joining us from the Seattle, Washington area. So nothing like making them feel at home here in Chicago. We're really excited to have all of you here today. And in fact, on behalf of Microsoft, I want to take a second and just thank you for letting us join on your cloud journey. Our hope for this summit is real simple. No matter where you're at in terms of your cloud journey, we're hopeful that you're going to walk away with the knowledge that you need to help elevate your organization's success in transitioning to the cloud. So we're going to start off with a keynote in just a second. We have a, just an amazing keynote speaker joining us here today, uh, actually returning to his roots here in the Midwest. But before we get into that, um, wanted to go ahead and talk a little bit about what, what's going to be uh, uh, in play for the day. We're going to have dozens of engineers, dozens of product managers imparting uh, information in 80 plus hands-on workshops, 60 plus on-demand labs where you're literally going to be able to roll up your sleeves and take advantage of some of the expertise that they're bringing to bear. And so we look for, for the opportunity to help you uh, impart the knowledge that you need to walk back and have a success in, in transitioning to the cloud. The keynote speaker we have here, again, I, as I said, he's returning to his roots here in the Midwest. He runs a team of subject matter experts out of our Redmond, Washington uh, facilities. And this team goes to bed at night, they wake up in the morning, and their sole mission is to enable our customers and partners, much like you, transition to the cloud. And so he's going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing in the cloud, where we're going with the cloud. We'll have some customer discussions along the way and he'll share some of the innovations that Microsoft has recently brought to the market. And so without any further ado, please join me in a huge welcome uh, and a, a great Midwest welcome back to our Corporate Vice President of Azure, Jason Zander. Awesome, thank you, Jim. All right, thanks, Jim. Hey, thanks, Chicago, as well as Jim mentioned. I did grow up in the Midwest, so I'm excited to, to be back here with all of you today uh, and with those the folks that are streaming online uh, and viewing all the material that's there. So we've got some fantastic sessions. We've brought a bunch of the team with us. We've got our team that lives and works right here with you, uh, and we're excited to go ahead and get started. So let's kick off, first of all, and start looking at what are we trying to accomplish at the top level for Microsoft? And really, our mission is to empower every person in every organization on the planet to achieve more. Now that means a combination of doing digital transformation in your business, both for your business as well as your partners uh, around the world. In addition to, we want to invest in your careers. And I want to talk about that when we get through this uh, program as well and some of the resources we're making available to you personally. Now we have three big ambitions. You think about enabling digital transformation. There's three big ambitions we have as a company. Start off with creating more personal computing. And that basically means from the devices that I'm gonna wind up using, I love my Surface Book, I love using Pen, it's fantastic, to some of the new innovations that we've got coming out. For example, the HoloLens. We're doing some amazing things, especially on areas like IoT, uh, being able to augment uh, reality with that for training purposes and for other things like that. Those are great examples of creating that kind of personal environment and things that interact and work very closely with you. We also work on reinvent productivity and business processes. And when you think about that, I think probably all of us here are working in some kind of team environment, whether it's directly with the like, engineering team or the group that you're in, uh, whether it's working with partners, you're part of the teams all the time. So being able to share, collaborate, find information, and become much more efficient, it makes you happier doing your job, it makes your team move that much faster, and we want to make sure we're investing well in that. And we're also building out the intelligent cloud platform that pulls all of this together. And so we're able to run, for example, all of our productivity suites on top of the intelligent cloud, but we can also bring that intelligent cloud back to you. 
And you can start turning it into really cool examples. So for example, you know, all of us you know, traveled to get here today, whether it's right inside of the city or you know, I came in on an airplane. Uh, under those circumstances, I could be sitting here right now knowing that I've got a meeting across town in another hour. And with Cortana, it can wake up and start understanding things about me. It can do things like look at my exchange calendar and figure out when do I need to be at that next meeting. It can use the intelligence graph that comes with things like Bing and look at traffic and say, you know what, you're probably going to need to leave about another 20 minutes earlier than you anticipated. And again, the cloud is the thing that pulls all that together. So that's just one example of being smarter about you, your context, and trying to then bring that intelligence back into the system and stitching these together. And we want to take that same value prop that's there, you'll see how we've integrated that into our own products, things like Office 365, but also how we're providing that same set of intrinsics and tools to you. So as you're building your software, you can actually make your applications do a lot of the same thing. We'll go through some of those examples uh, as we make it. Now, if you think about cloud capabilities, the cloud is a generational shift in computing and it represents major changes for everyone. That includes us at Microsoft. I've been at the company actually for two decades now, and we've made the big shift ourselves from building uh, purely on-premises software that we work with. Of course, we still do that, but in addition to that, trying to make this leap into the cloud. And I can tell you as an owner of some of that technology, it's required a lot of changes for our own engineering teams, figuring out how to go take some of the software, and we're running it ourselves. We've learned a tremendous amount. We've tried to fold that back into the products as well. Uh, being able to operate and run on a 24-7 basis. We've had to also figure out how do our business models evolve? How do we evolve our partner networks? How do we make sure uh, that we're bringing everybody along for the ride? That's been changes for us, and I suspect you are looking at similar things for your business. Because every organization over the next few years is going to need a strategy for how you move from where you are today to what you're going to have to do in the future. And we think the cloud is a big part of helping with that. So as I look across all of those solutions, everything from business productivity, infrastructure, applications, and that environment, that's how we're going to do it. And it's the combination of all of those scenarios that you saw that are going to enable organizations to become more agile. We want to lower our costs. We want to really differentiate and transform our businesses as we go. And we really believe that if you look at the Microsoft Cloud, no other company offers the breadth and depth of what the Microsoft Cloud has. And I hope to be able to show you more of that today. And I want to start off, first of all, by framing this across three attributes that we focus really hard on, global, trusted, and hybrid. And we think it's actually the combination of these attributes that we've built into the system that leads to our differentiation in this market, and by extension, uh, your ability to leverage that uh, and be able to use it in your own businesses. I want to start off with global, just to give you a perspective on what we're doing. What you're seeing here is our global worldwide map. The important part for us about global is to be able to have you be able to reach uh, your employees. Uh, if you're a multinational like us, you've got offices all around the world. So having connectivity to get closer to your employees is super important. And you've got customers potentially all over the world as well. So whether you are a big company doing consulting or that kind of work, or you're a small startup that wants to do global expansion, you know, being able to have that global reach is super important. We also want to make sure that our regions here really go into the, all the places you want. Here you can see we have 38 Azure regions worldwide. It's actually more than Amazon and Google combined. And we continue to expand. Those are just the 38 regions that we have announced. Most recently, we've opened our data center to GA in the United Kingdom, uh, in addition to Germany. And we have others that are coming up uh, in parts of the Asia Pacific region as well. And we have things like our China cloud, which has actually been there for three years now and operating. Uh, we're the first multinational cloud to be able to operate there in a sovereign model. And if any of you are working in the European Union, our German cloud also has a data trustee model. That means that all the data is run and taken care of by European citizens according to European compliance. So if you need something that works well in that environment, we have unique solutions like that as well. Now, what are these regions? Because there's a lot of stuff on the map. One of these blue dots here actually represents a cluster of data centers that go together to create a region. It's both for us to be able to host the work that we have, like Office 365, or Xbox Live, or Skype, or take your pick. But in addition to that, for everyone here to be able to use as well uh, through public offerings like Azure. I thought it would be interesting to take a look and see what do these data centers actually look like. Some of you may work every day in a data center. Uh, I want to share with you ours. Let's go ahead and roll the video.
can I just say how much I love my day job? <laughs> it's so much fun. We've been building out data centers worldwide like this. We've run into all sorts of amazing things as we go. I just want to make that video my screensaver. So it's just a, it's a lot of fun. So these are the examples of the data centers that we have, and we are building these out for you. Really, uh, the truth is being able to build something at this scale means that we're able to make things very cost effective. We've got an awesome supply chain that's there. It means we can enable those cloud promises, things like elasticity, being able to scale up your workloads and scale them down when it's required, uh, and being able to do all that modernization is there. And we're going to talk about hybrid coming up in just a minute because we have a uh, unique value props there as well. So that gives you an idea of our worldwide scale uh, and the work that we're doing from a global perspective. Now, we're also very interested in making sure that we have a trusted cloud because you know, we understand the, the critical requirements of running software for businesses uh, include certifications, data sovereignty, security, and privacy. And it's not just about the technology. Uh, we're going to do a lot of technology videos uh, and, and, and demonstrations here today at the conference. But you know, Microsoft has decades of experience supporting businesses and enterprise customers of all sizes. In fact, I think the Microsoft Cloud has more compliance certifications than any cloud vendor. And you see some examples that are here. Anything from particular verticals, things like healthcare and government and that kind of coverage, as well as regional coverage. So if you're working again worldwide, Australia, China, Europe, take your pick, then we have certifications there as well. And what I would also tell you is that we follow all the data, you know, sovereignty and requirement laws for places like the European Union and these other environments so that you've got great protection for that. Uh, and in addition to having more certifications, more of these logos that are here, the other thing that's super interesting is to go take a look at the number of services that are actually covered. Because as you go off and build solutions and you deploy them, it's not just about having you know, four or five services that are part of that. You actually want coverage for broader because there's more functionality for you to take advantage of. Uh, and if you're going for your own clearance, uh, on your own workloads, you need to have that. So we continue to make massive investments. We've got the most of any cloud provider there, and we're adding more. These are just the ones that are already done, and it's not even the entire list. We have actually closer to 50 uh, that are there today and climbing. Now, the next piece that we're really paying attention to is hybrid. Uh, and that one's super important because we don't view hybrid cloud or private cloud as just a trend. It's not just kind of a buzzword. Uh, it's the reality, we believe, for especially large companies that are there, including ourselves. We don't expect that anybody's just going to go snap their finger and all of a sudden everything's landing inside of the public cloud. We think there's actually permanent and valuable solutions that really leverage hybrid as well. And we're the only vendor on the planet that has both deep on-premises experience and globally secure, this hyperscale cloud that you just saw, and a technology stack that is meant to actually go cover that. And to me, hybrid is it's, it's much more than just some kind of connectivity between your data center and mine. Of course, we have to have that, but that's just where it starts. Real hybrid to us also means you have consistency around the technology areas. It's not just a Lego kit to take home, but there's product truth behind that. And we've done a significant amount of work across all of these environments that are here. As an example, if I look at, of course, we've got infrastructure that's there, but app platform, uh, those components too, identity and federated identity, so I can manage you know, Active Directory and Azure Active Directory and have those things actually go together, all the way down to things like the data platform. We have features in SQL Server 2016, for example, Table Stretch, one of my favorites. You can automatically have a table span both your private cloud and your public cloud just by setting a range partition. We'll manage it for you. Think of orders history that goes back for a decade or more. And we'll just go ahead and do the work. So you just run a normal query, and we'll figure out where the data is and pull it back for you. There's no weird you know, rocket science stuff to go do. Those are examples of building that consistently. Same thing with the control plane, the management plane, all your command line tools, all your SDKs, the environment works exactly the same. And in fact, in most cases, we actually use exactly the same code in order to be able to execute on that vision. Now, if you look at that, all those capabilities that I just showed, those ambitions as well, then we're really excited about the momentum that we're seeing. In fact, we have over 90% of Fortune 500s using the Microsoft Cloud today. And you see some great examples of companies that we work with very closely out there today. And in fact, the momentum has been great. We've got over 120,000 new Azure subscriptions coming in every month. So we're very excited about that. That's what fills up those big data centers and allows us to go back and add even more functionality for you going forward. Now, what I'd really like to do today is I'd like to actually share some examples of those. And I want to start off with a partner that we've worked very close with, uh, Rockwell Automation. And let me introduce Troy Marr, who's the uh, Business Intelligence COE Architecture Lead uh, at Rockwell Automation. Please help me join Troy to the stage. Troy. 
Morning, Jason. Good morning, Troy. So we've had a really good partnership with Rockwell uh, and Azure, uh, but I think it'd be great for you to share uh, with our audience here. Tell us a little bit more about Rockwell Automation, the company. Certainly. Rockwell Automation is the world's largest company dedicated to industrial automation and information. We have a long history, um, going back 110 years or more, where we've dedicated ourselves to helping our customers automate their plants, facilities, hospitals, oil, gas, uh, oil and gas refineries through the creation or design and manufacturing of devices such as controls and switches that allow them to better achieve efficiencies and effectiveness throughout their operations. We have 22,000 employees operating in 80 countries around the world and our goal and mission is to help these companies operate better, more effectively, make them more productive, and make the world more sustainable. So that's fantastic. So great example, global company, big company, uh, and, and over 110 years. That's a long time to be, right. in, to be in business. So uh, what's interesting is, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your vision for digital transformation? Because you guys have been doing this, you're experts at it, you've been doing it for a while. Certainly. How are you digitally transform? So going back a few years, we've been at the forefront of integrating technology into these devices, such as uh, controls and switches. And we um, have embedded Ethernet into the devices to enable them to talk to one another. And for years, we've had integrated control systems and integrated architecture. But our current vision is something called the connected enterprise, where we have all the smart devices on plant floors or in hospitals or, what, or whatever you have, may have. And the connected enterprise is going to really build on the concept of the Internet of Things and allow all of these devices, they could be Rockwell devices or even other devices made by other manufacturers, and allow all that data to come together and gather that insight, collect it, and, and enable the customers to gain insight into plant level and enterprise network uh, processes hmm. to, to enable faster de uh, decision making and collaborate uh, better across the their business operations. So you get tons of devices, so basically, you know, really advanced Internet of Things technology mm -hmm. in some ways, being able to pull the digital piece back in. Right. How does the cloud help you uh, with that problem? Because right. now I've got data flowing in, what do you do with it? Certainly. So it's, it's very exciting for us and exciting for me because my responsibility within the BI Center of Excellence is really focused initially on the corporate analytics, but as we de develop our vision for the connected enterprise, we're really taking Internet of Things data coming from customers and mashing that up against what we're doing with the cloud with Azure and combining that data together. So we have a very strong partnership with Microsoft. You're actually a strategic partner on our go-to-market strategy. So a lot of your technology is built into the products we sell. Um, and what we're going to do, in, uh, and we're actually doing it already, is bring that data from the Internet of Things into our data lake, which is being hosted in Microsoft Azure. We have Cloudera Hadoop running already and we're being able to mash that data together with corporate data hmm. and develop applications such as predictive maintenance. Oh, cool. So I have a combination of the operational technology, machine yep. and equipment coming in. I have our IT estate that I've got with data, and you mentioned Hadoop in there as well. I believe you also do work with, uh, with SAP and yep. other environments there too? Yeah, so back in, in terms of the operational technology with IoT, it's the ability for us to take our, um, and you talked about hybrid for mm -hmm. Azure, it's really that hybrid combination. We were able to set up within Azure basically a private network within your public cloud. So we put in our own security stack with our own firewall, load balancers, and hmm. encryption cool. technology. That's our corporate environment. And we have SAP HANA running. We actually worked with Microsoft to get you certified to run HANA in a production Thank environment. Thank you for that. We appreciate um, that. We have Cloudera Hadoop running. We have Prophecy Maestro running for um, uh, customer master data management. And we're a very big Power BI user as well. Oh, fantastic. And, so we've got everything in there. Which That's... is a wonderful tool. So if you look at that hybrid IT concept, we're running Power BI out in the Azure public cloud. We have a private network running within your Azure public cloud. And that is really a view or a, a structure that represents an extension of our on-premise on data center. Hmm. Uh, that's how we kind of Perfect. view it. So good all hybrid. So I know there's, there's a lot of folks here that I think are probably undertaking similar projects or doing their own planning. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give folks since you're, you're well into this? Do um, you have any good advice for folks? Like how should they get started? You know, what, what worked for you? Sure. Um, work very closely with your Microsoft reps and, and the solution engineers. Look at the possibilities. So when we first started off, um, it wasn't really the, our BICOE's recommendation to say, let's build out a private network. 
Um, our IT organization was already doing that. We were just one of the first ones to utilize it. Hmm. But as we started working with our internal IT staff as well as the Microsoft staff, staff, we identified certain areas that we needed to beef up in terms of the security uh, stack that needed to be in place, special circumstances that we wanted to you know, build out to better support IoT. So for example, putting in Kafka brokers and this sure. would get a little technical. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but really look at what's the, you know, the, the, put some design thinking into it and, and, and identify what you are going to need, not just now, but in the future from a hybrid IT yeah, perspective. Yeah, perfect, and then get going and move from there. Awesome, that's super helpful. So I want to really thank you for the partnership, Troy, uh, and thank you for being here today. Very good, it's a wonderful partnership. Thank you, Trex. Good luck. Thank you. So it gives you a great example of being able to integrate and do the hybrid combination. Uh, as Troy mentioned, SAP, uh, Hadoop, uh, infrastructure components, private and public cloud. Now, I want to then turn over to going into a little bit more detail on how do we go ahead and do that. And if you look at Microsoft Azure, we've got multiple different parts of the, of the stack and services available for you. And of course, it starts off with a core infrastructure that we have. So compute, networking, and storage, and the ability to you know, just use uh, straightforward virtual machines. Uh, in fact, we actually doubled the number of compute types that you can actually use in the year 2016 alone, adding new uh, compute types that are either large in memory, faster SSD, in some cases, more CPU and less disk that's super cool for gaming applications for example so anything that needs that level or it needs to move the other end uh, and as Troy mentioned SAP and HANA uh, is another first class thing we have the largest uh, solution that I have for SAP HANA implementations today has four terabytes of RAM uh, available to run HANA on the back end so if you've got a big yes four terabytes of RAM not disk RAM. And I've had requests for about four times that much, so we're working on that. So, but we'll, we will keep, uh, keep going on that. But those are just an example of trying to figure out what would you need to be successful on this? How can we help you out with that? That's what we're basically doing. But we also have added platform services, and I get really excited about this because in the same way that infrastructure as a service helps us move past the kind of rack and stack component, we can give that to you, platform as a service gives us additional value on top of that. So for example, we'll take care of the patching for you if you're doing, for example, a website or a mobile back end, or in the case of IoT, IoT hub, streaming, analytics, and those sort of things, allows you to get up and going very, very quickly. We've also invested in microservices architecture and frameworks for that, and you'll see more from a developer side coming up pretty soon. But there's a really great set of those, and we build more and more stuff into the intelligence uh, piece on those as well. And again, we're making sure that you can use these types of workloads, not only for the public cloud, but being able to also push some of these uh, capabilities in from a hybrid perspective as well. And so you can do exactly the sort of scenarios that Troy outlined from before. Now, Azure is also an open platform. And I think the big thing to me is I want to make sure I'm meeting you where you live. And the truth is many of us are maybe working in companies where multiple companies have come together. Uh, we've got different departments. They have different stacks. They use different programming languages. Uh, it's pretty rare for a big company to be completely homogeneous. In addition to that, there's a significant amount of innovation that's happening out there across the board. And so we want to make sure that Azure really is an open platform and support your ability to target multiple devices, multiple operating systems, programming languages, and tools. And you can see just a handful of things that we have on here today. And in fact, we're seeing a significant amount of momentum for things like Linux. In fact, over a third of the virtual machines that we have deployed in public cloud Azure are already Linux. It's actually over half in China, as an example. And our run rate is continuing to go much, much higher as we start seeing people deploy more and more open software that's there. And so we've got a really great solution for that. And it is definitely a first class solution for you because we, again, I want to make sure that you get first class support for all the workloads that you're planning on running. Now, we just talked about Rockwell and Troy gave us a great overview of some of the work that they're doing, but let me share a couple of other examples that we have. First, our partner, Esri, and Esri delivers geospatial databases uh, with tens of thousands of databases, actually, and you can tap into it with product integration, including Power BI and Azure Machine Learning. So if you think about things where I'm trying to go back and figure out, again, from a geospatial uh, perspective, being able to overlay and pull that data in is super important for that type of application. And you know, the way the product used to work is that it would take hours to get some of those updates into the system, which if you're doing you know, other stuff, you want to move much faster. So moving into the cloud and choosing Azure for that means you can actually now take what used to take hours and basically do it in real time. Now I get that live update, I can integrate it with those tools, and now I have that functionality. I can use it directly inside of the analytics tools or directly inside of my application. 
The other example I want to mention here is ChronoDrive. And ChronoDrive is a drive-through grocery service in France. And the customers there, what they do is you order online and you drive to the location to pick up your groceries that are there. Now, the big thing for that kind of business is really wanting to see up-to-date information on inventory. What are people buying in each location? What does it look like? And doing a combination of optimizing so that people get exactly what they want and I can cut down on the waste. So that way customers are happy and from a business model perspective, then I have a nice business because I'm very, very efficient on that. And while using Azure, they've been actually able to cut order processing times in half and also cut their costs significantly as well related to the inventory side of that. So not only the mobile engagement piece here, but also the analytics on the back end, another good example of being able to leverage uh, that cloud and that reach uh, to be able to solve those problems. And those are just a few examples. Now let's talk a little bit more about how we use this. So we've seen some hybrid examples that we talked about, but the more that you run apps and infrastructure in the cloud, then one of the things we know that you'll need to do is be able to manage it in across multiple environments. Okay, so our management services are designed for that. Today, you've quite likely in your data center, you've got probably a combination of, you've got stuff on top of Hyper-V, you maybe have some VMware servers that are there, these are bare metal servers that you're running, you're doing the virtualization on those. You've obviously, you know, you've got the cloud if you're starting to adopt that as well, and I'm now starting to get a bigger and bigger footprint, and I gotta manage it, I gotta make sure that it's secure uh, and it's there. So we've done an integrated solution that enables log analytics, automation, backup, disaster recovery, data protection, uh, as well as integrated security and analysis reporting. And we actually use our own technology for this. So I can enable scenarios, for example, of being able to fail over from on-premises to public cloud and vice versa. I can set those pairs up and actually run it that way if I want to, right? Log and backup and storage totally makes sense. I can make sure that I've got, you know, geo redundant storage and you saw with the regions how we spread things out for disaster recovery. So all of those things are super important. And I'd also say that we use our own stuff for this. So for example, the ability to crunch tons of data and do analytics and machine learning against that, we actually use the same products there to go build things like our management suite and our security and threat analytics because it gives us the ability to get really deep insights and turn around and make those available to you as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at all this technology and I want to invite Jeff Woolsey up on stage. Jeff, take it away. Thank you, Jason. How's everyone doing today? Oh, we can do a little bit better than that. How's everybody doing today? Awesome, thank you very much. My name's Jeff Woolsey, and it is really a pleasure to be here to show you Azure in action. Now, as Jason has mentioned, uh, Azure is global. We want you to be able to create resources, access resources, monitor wherever you are, anywhere around the world. It's hybrid. We want you to give you the best of both worlds. If you want to take advantage of the scale, the massive capabilities in the public cloud, great. If you want to maintain the control, if you have things that you still want to run on premises, fantastic. Or if you're like 95% of the people we talk to, you want hybrid so bad you can taste it. You want to take advantage of the best of both, bring these together, and run your organization in the best possible way. And then finally, when it comes to security, you don't want to be in the headlines. You don't want to be one of those groups being hacked out there. We want to give you the best cloud out there with the best tools, the best layers of protection, and most importantly, give you a cloud you can trust. So let's dig in. First of all, I just want to show you right off the bat what you're looking at here is the Azure portal. And before I drill into something very specific, I just want to give you a quick rundown. You see here, this is just a quick um, overview of some of the hundreds of services that are available right now in Azure. Under compute, you want virtual machines, containers, batch accounts, service fabric clusters, container registries, availability sets, and more. Under networking, virtual networks, load balancers, application gateways, virtualization network gateways, routing tables, CDN profiles, express route, and so much more. Storage tables, queues, blobs, data lakes, store simple, recovery, backup, site recovery, and more. Web, mobile, API, notification hub, search services, and more. Databases, SQL, NoSQL, Redis, data factories, SQL elastic pools, and more. HD Insight, Hadoop, Intelligence, Analytics, IoT, uh, Internet of Things, I could literally go on and on and on. My point being is, if you're a company right now who wants to be agile, Sure, you can go buy a heck of a lot of servers, a heck of a lot of storage and compute and set all of this stuff up yourself and take the next, I don't know, year or two trying to make it all work, or this is a couple clicks away. The point is, let's give you the best of both worlds. So 
That's just a few of the things. And by the way, this just continues to scroll and scroll. And we are constantly adding more services. Now, I'm going to go something that's familiar to everyone, virtual machines. And virtual machines is a perfect example to show you our global reach. You'll see I've got VMs running in the eastern United States, western Europe, central US, Australia, uh, southeast Asia, Brazil, literally all over the world. And these are all being, uh, all being delivered through Azure. Now, of course, as you look at this, you may be thinking, Jeff, this is great, but how do I monitor all of this? Well, that's a great question. In fact, one of the ways to do that would be through Azure monitoring. With Azure monitoring, we can provide you granular, real-time access of your applications, your workloads, your services. For example, in, uh, I'm going to bring up an application here, and one of the things I want to point out here that we're doing through Azure Metrics is we're taking advantage of analytics, metrics, objects, and telemetry to deliver this granular real-time monitoring. So for example, I've got an application, and in fact, I want to take a look at its CPU time and its average response time. Now, looks like it's uh, just been going for a little while now, so not too much is happening. It looks like my loan application's been running for a little while. But what I'm seeing here is my real response time, my CPU time, and this will update in real time as my application is going. And of course, if this is an important application to me, I can pin this to my dashboard, and it'll be readily available. Now, this is great for real-time monitoring, but what about the, in the logs and the intelligence and historical information that I've already built up in my, app, in my organization? For example, you probably know that your applications, your OS, your services, your cloud services, they're storing logs. How many times have you proactively gone and done a log search? Well, probably the only time you ever do it is when you're trying to diagnose some sort of problem. Well, guess what? There's actually a rich set of resources and data in there that you could be mining to help your organization run better. So for example, I'm going to bring up the log search here. And what this is going to do is I'm going to create a very simple query. In fact, I'm just going to do a wildcard search. And I want it to actually search through all of the logs that I have in my organization. This is petabytes of logs that I literally found in just over a second. I came back with 6 million results. Now, you may be thinking, gee, Jeff, that's great, but six million results, what am I going to do with that? That's, that's actually way too much information. And you know what? You'd be right. What you want to do is you want to be able to say, hey, is there a way I can look at this data in a different way that will actually characterize this so I can you know, ba basically understand this better? So now we've done the same search by type. Now I can see, oh, guess what? There's 41 areas. I've got a bunch of perf logs. I've got some security events. I've got some firewall events. OK, now I can actually start to break this down and to figure out strategies for me going forward to better uh, to, to, to look at this and mine the data that I'm already collecting. This is an area where people realize that they have a very big blind spot to what's already happening in their infrastructure. Now, on top of this, you can also create your own complex queries, your own queries that say, you know what? I, I want to look at all of the elastic search resources in my organization. And so I've just pasted in this query, and it's doing exactly that. Here are all of my elastic pools, and I can see, yeah, these all seem to be running pretty well. I do have one that's running a little hot here. Which one is this? This is my Contoso test database. OK, that's fine. We're probably doing some scale testing. That's why this one outlier is running really, really hot. But again, I'm getting this information using these log analytics. Now, you may be thinking, OK, Jeff, great. But you know what? I don't want to have to create custom queries for every one of those. And you don't have to. These are great for you know, um, applications you've written or things that, things that you want to dive into. But we also have a whole bunch of intelligence out of the box defaults. For example, Active Directory Assessment. Think of it as we're actually sitting there telling you, giving you recommendations, high priority recommendations around your domain controllers, low priority recommendations, and we're actually running tests against your DCs to say, by the way, here are some things you can do to better harden your Active Directory infrastructure. Application insights, Azure SQL, logic apps, change tracking, Office 365, SQL assessment, uh, security and auditing. One that's uh, very highly recommended, a lot of people love this one, is the security update assessment. Wouldn't it be great if I could actually see all of my Windows servers, all of my Linux servers, and understand what's the patch status from a single, well, here it is, right there in the out-of-the-box configuration here. Um, I can see I've got my Windows, my Linux, I'm missing some updates. 
guess what? I can now drill into those, very quickly go through it and actually take care and it, take advantage of all of that. Pretty cool and easy, and again, using out of the box defaults. Now, of course, we also wanna make monitoring personal. For example, if I'm the database guy, I wanna be able to look at just my databases, maybe my storage, maybe my IO. If I'm the virtualization person, maybe I wanna look at my Hyper-V host or my VMware host and figure out which ones are hot. Well, I can create my own custom dashboards, and in fact, if I wanna edit the dashboards, it's literally, folks, drag and drop. You know what, I wanna drop in some resources here, or I wanna add um, a clock, or a video, or service health, or something from the marketplace. Literally drop it into the dashboard. When I'm done, click on Done Customizing, and in fact, I can share this with colleagues, so we can all each have our own individuals, but I can also share dashboards with others. And of course, if I want to really focus in, I can go into full screen mode. And of course, this is all delivered in beautiful HTML5, so it's all touch friendly as well, and I can do all of that from my Surface here as well. Finally, from a security standpoint, we've made huge investments in the Azure Security Center. Here, you can see I'm actually taking advantage of the work that, again, we're gonna give you back to your organization. And again, let me remind you, none of this has to be running in Azure. This could be all on-premises. This could all be in Azure. This could be in AWS. This could be in VMware. This could be in Windows Server. Or most likely, it's in all of those places because we understand people want to run hybrid or are already doing so. So what we're doing is we're looking at all of your organization wherever it resides and we're saying, look, we actually have some recommendations to help better secure your organization. Things you may not even be thinking about. So look here, we already have a number of recommendations uh, for uh, enabling advanced security, enabling a VM agent. I need to install some endpoint protection. I have a bunch of applications, it appears here, that I need to add a web application firewall. So I'm gonna click into here, and you can see, wow, I'm not sure what happened here, but apparently we deployed a bunch of apps um, without a web application firewall like this sales app. So I'm gonna drill into that. I could use my existing F5 and add my web application firewall. I could go in here and create new and I could add you know, a bunch of, I, I could use my F5, I could use one from Barracuda or Imperva. Folks, I haven't left this console a single time. This is all happening from in my browser. That's how powerful this is. Finally, let's go back here one more time and let's talk about what happens when you are under active attack. How do you know that? Most people don't find out till weeks, months, maybe even longer that they've actually been hacked or been the target of attack. Well, in our security alerts, we're talking about real-time detection here that's happening. So I'm gonna drill in here and it's gonna show me, give me a history of what's been going on and actually tell me when the last in incident was detected. In fact, I can see one I had recently here. We're gonna drill in and understand what, what happened in this security incident. And in fact, not only does it tell me what happened, but it's actually gonna provide me the steps, it's gonna tell me when and where and remediation steps. And apparently, I had a SQL injection attack, it was blocked, it was on this VM, this specific at this time, and there was a failed RDP brute force attack, um, but then it continued, and there was a successful RDP brute force attack. So someone spent some time hammering on an RDP server, probably found a password that wasn't strong enough, and has now gotten in and gotten to this VM. So now what I need to do is, I need to alert security, we need to take this thing offline, we need to look for malware, but we also probably need to look at our passwords and figure out, hey, should we be hardening and make, making this more difficult? So this is just a quick overview of some of the things that are here and available in Azure. Think about what you've seen here. Again, global reach, being able to run VMs and workloads at, the, at the, just a couple clicks away. Being able to better secure your infrastructure and of course, built with hybrid in mind from the ground up. That's what Azure is all about. Delivering the best public, private, and most importantly, hybrid cloud for your organization. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you. So you saw some really great examples there, and again, being able to leverage the platform to do some of the cool stuff that Jeff showed you. Now, our hybrid vision for the cloud also includes power and flexibility to run infrastructure everywhere like we talked about. But the next step that we need to talk about is how am I gonna go build those applications? And in particular, I think many of us are trying to figure out how do I build apps and modernize them for a cloud-first, mobile-first world? And that means I need to be able to target multiple form factors, multiple devices that are out there and make that go. Now, we've got a whole host of solutions for that. We start off with Visual Studio. And the Visual Studio family itself provides complete development tools 
tools and offering, you're basically about a file new project away from being able to get your first cloud or your mobile app uh, up and running if you haven't already built one. So there are fantastic first class solutions for those and again, the skill sets are there. You've also think about the work that we've done with .NET. We've made big investments uh, in the .NET framework as well. In fact, the most recent release we've had with .NET Core is designed so that you can get a much smaller footprint. It is actually really designed to do very, very well with container-based solutions, microservices development that you're doing. Also happens to run cross-platform. I can make it work on Linux as well, and it's open source. You can go get it uh, attached and go take a look at the source code uh, that's in there, and you're all covered. The key thing for this to me as well, especially for our developers and folks that you know practice with us every day, it means that if you have your investment and you've learned the tools, you've learned the programming language, you've learned the framework, that those are examples where you're going to be able to take those skills and pull them forward into this cloud era as well. So if you start then using containers, starting to write microservices architecture, all that skill set you had directly accrues towards that. We're trying to make sure uh, that that continues. Now we've also added other components in here. Visual Studio Code is a great example, and this one's actually more development focused. So whereas Visual Studio itself has a lot of productivity features that are in there with designers and all sorts of things that make life easy for building applications, VS Code is especially designed when you want to have a co focus on your code. So I care the most about the code window and what I'm doing, and command line operations is that kind of a work style. And it also includes fantastic support for Java, Node.js, Python, PHP, and a host of other languages as well. And in fact, it's become very popular and growing quite fast. There's actually teams at uh, companies like Google and Uber, they're actually using VS Code uh, inside for their own engineering teams for productivity purposes. And again, the ability to run it on a Mac, run it on Linux, it runs cross-platform, which basically means whatever form factor you're using, you can have that. And there's an open ecosystem around it so we can continue to extend it. Now, last year we also acquired a company called Xamarin, and we've actually partnered very closely with Xamarin over the years, and Xamarin gives you a, a, the ability to do cross-device targeting, but do it with a .NET way, so I can write essentially native applications for iOS and for Android, and of course for Windows, but I can write those device applications. I can use, again, the skill set, the framework, and everything else to do that, and I can do that with the Visual Studio tools that I'm used to. And we made Xamarin actually available for free. It is part of Visual Studio. So you've got Visual Studio, you have access to Xamarin as well. So all of these tools are designed uh, to bring together for developers the ability to build these really cool applications. Now, after you get that going, I believe probably all of us are working in some kind of a team. So we also want to make sure that we're covered not just from the code editing and that kind of inner debug loop, but also the ability to bring that code out and give it to your users. So we've invested also heavily in Visual Studio team services. In particular, it starts off with the course, our code repository, source code control, and the build and deployment pipeline so I can get continuous integration and continuous deployment. Those are things we've built in, and as you'd expect from Visual Studio, the ability uh, for that family line to make that super easy to get going and automate it, fast time to success. I'm also super excited about the test cloud that we've integrated in. This is another thing that came with Xamarin. And so if you've ever had to build an application that needs to work across devices, I mean, I suspect if we were to go pool our devices and try and cluster them together in the hallway, how many versions of Android, how many versions of iOS and which devices would you have just in the pockets of the folks that we have here? It's pretty broad. And so if I'm trying to build an application that's going out there, I want to make sure that I have compatibility, that it works well, and I want to be able to test across all of those at once. And the test cloud helps you be able to do that. So I can actually go through, make sure the UI metaphors, the sizing, and everything else across that's going to work. And you don't have the kind of you know, embarrassing problem where you release a new build and your CIO is calling up and saying, hey, it doesn't work on 10.2 of you know, whatever they just rolled out last night. So those are good examples we've integrated. Also, beta testing is super important. Uh, we acquired Hockey App a while back that gives us the ability to manage multiple versions. You can do your beta testing, get feedback from users. Uh, does this do what you like? What's the feedback look like? And then finally, monitoring analytics, very deep in the ability to get you know, from left to right of what's going on. So no matter if you're doing, you know, you're targeting multiple devices on the mobile side, and as well as the cloud for the backing, then you've got a good solution from our authoring tools, dev tools, and through the entire ALM component. 
The last thing I want to talk about in this space, especially around applications, is data. And I think data is, you know, it's always been, you know, for decades, it's been one of the core parts of applications that we're building. So we want you to be able to take advantage of that. And we build systems to help out with this. It starts off, first of all, with information management. So where is my data? You know, where is the data lake? Where are the streams coming through? Uh, our big data stores, because you're going to pump a lot of data through. I think we heard from Rockwell, they're pumping a huge amount of data through there. You know, I need to be able to do things, not just terabyte level stores, but petabytes and actually Microsoft would do exabyte level scale. Uh, just today alone, just a core part of my team will crunch about five petabytes of logging data and that's just around compute networking and storage. It has nothing to do actually as you go higher up or into office. So we collect, manage all that data and we can gain insights on it to figure out exactly what's going on inside of the environment. What we've tried to do is take those same platforms that we built to run the Microsoft uh, you know, properties over 15 years and make those part of what we're giving to you as well. So then we can get into the analytics, and actually Jeff showed some great examples of analytics, being able to derive some insights out of that data, and we finish up with machine learning. So getting even deeper and looking for patterns that are there. We've done some really great things with companies like Rolls-Royce, for example, with their jet turbines, and working with partner airlines, where we've been able to use machine learning to actually look at the same planes, same routes, same conditions, but find 15% fuel savings just by taking, you know, changing taxiing and takeoff procedures. And if you've ever been you know, familiar with the airline industry, 40% of your cost is fuel. So 15% is a massive change. And that actually came out of looking for deeper insights with machine learning. So no matter you know, what level you light this up at, we want to make sure that you've got the full support for that. We end with full AI, you know, the voice recognition, uh, visual sort of uh, things that are in there as well, the ability to see and hear what's going on and having machines be able to do that. And you can engage at whatever level you want. If you want to use our GPU SKUs and start at the base, you can do that. If you want to start using our cognitive services and the Cortana Intelligence Suite, you can just program against those. And we've got the rocket science built in underneath of that. All of these things are now designed between the developer tools, the runtimes and frameworks, all this data and analytics stuff to build around it, and then the ability to reach cross-platform and leverage the cloud for this. They're all about building intelligent applications where I can start to pull these things together and modernize and kind of get past forms over data and into insights as well. So the next thing I want to be able to take a look at is let's go ahead and look at building and leveraging an intelligent application. For that, I'm going to invite Craig up on stage. So Craig, let's take a look at intelligent apps. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Morning. So today I'm going to show you a modern application that really embodies those principles of intelligence that Jason just spoke to, from data storage to analytics and machine learning. Uh, this application is called First Response Online. And it's an application for managing emergency response services in the city of Sammamish back in Washington. Uh, so that includes you know, police, fire, medical, ambulance services. Now, I'm going to show you today the Windows version of this application with some sample data in there. But we've actually also got an entirely, completely native iOS and Android version of the application as well that's built entirely using .NET, C Sharp, and taking advantage of that Xamarin technology that Jason also referred to earlier. So I'm going to go ahead and log into the application here. I'm going to log in as a police officer, John Clarkson. And you'll see when we get in here, I've got a nice uh, map of the city. And these little dots represent incidents that are happening around the city, as well as the emergency responders that are already deployed around the city. And I've got an incident here that's been assigned to me. It's a speeding incident. So I'm going to go ahead and take a look at that. And it looks like somebody's re reported a speeding vehicle. Um, I'm not doing anything, and I'm going to go check this out and uh, potentially issue a ticket to this individual. So I'm going to navigate to the scene. Now you'll see this little blue dot here represents me actually navigating down uh, to where the report actually took place. And let's see, did I already do that? Now it looks like this incident has just been updated. I got an automatic push notification from the cloud that the incident has changed. And now the report is that this motorist has actually collided with a curb and is potentially injured. So now it's gone from a speeding ticket to potentially an accident investigation. So now I'm on the scene. I want to make sure this individual is OK. So I have uh, I've spoken with the individual. He seems to be all right. And now I need to identify who he is to create my police report. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, identify him. And I've asked him for his name. Now the individual told me his name was Zhao. But I didn't hear him so well. And I thought he actually said his name was Joe. So I'm going to go ahead and run a search here for Joe. 
Now I'm searching uh, the local Department of Motor Vehicles database here in the city of Sammamish. I'm a police officer, I can do that. Um, and this database has actually been configured with Azure Search. And our Azure Search Index has been configured with a custom analyzer that enables phonetic search. So you'll notice here, I'm not only getting back exact matches for Joe, but I'm also getting uh, matches for things that sound like Joe. And in looking at the driver's license photos here in the database, I'm seeing that this individual uh, down here, Zhao, is actually the individual that I'm speaking with. So I'm gonna go ahead and associate him uh, with, my, with my report. So let's go ahead now and take a look at the data and all the services that are actually powering this application on the back end. So here we are back in the Azure portal that you saw during Jeff's demo, and I've got an Azure resource group that shows all of the different services that are powering my application. You'll notice here I've got a lot of SQL databases. Now this application was built by an ISV using a traditional sharding pattern, a horizontal sharding pattern. So each of these agencies, police, fire, medical, they all have their own database. Um, that they store their individual information in, but we want to be able to surface data from all those different databases in the application, right? Um, I also want to be able to monitor and manage those databases as a collective unit. With Azure Elastic Pools, I can now do that. So I've got a pool that's configured here that's actually got all of those different databases uh, inside of it. And the great thing is that I can actually see what's happening with these databases. This, again, sample data, the utilization's pretty low here. But imagine a scenario where we have a natural disaster in the city, and I wanna be able to make sure all of those agencies have the appropriate compute resources for their, data, uh, for their databases uh, to handle that increased load. I can go in here and just go ahead and click Configure Pool, and by just dragging this slider bar here and clicking Save, I can actually allocate additional compute resources to that entire pool so all of those databases will have a shared set of resources that they can use in the event of some kind of uh, event. Now you may be thinking from a developer point of view, the devs in the room are probably thinking, you know, programming against multiple shards like that or multiple databases seems a little bit cumbersome. I have to figure out how to query those things, aggregate those results back together, and that's a little bit of a pain. Well, what we've done is we've actually built some tools for you to do that, and they're called the Elastic Tools, and they're part of the Azure SDK. So I'm gonna show you how this works. So here I am, uh, I'm in Visual Studio, and I've got the project loaded, which is my mobile backend. So this is an ASP.NET Web API backend that my mobile app connects to, and this backend code actually goes and runs a query against those databases. And I'm in a controller here just called get all incidents, and it just gets the current set of incidents from the database, um, and I've actually already clicked run, so I'm debugging. I'm gonna go ahead and make a call into this controller method uh, to see how the query works. And I'm just gonna use PowerShell to do that because it's an easy way to send a HTTP request. I'm just calling localhost, you'll see here. And I've actually hit my breakpoint here in Visual Studio so we can step through now. And you'll notice in just a couple of lines of code, I can get my connection strings, I can create what's called uh, a, sh a shard map, and I can use my shard map, sorry, to create an array of shards and then with one line of code here, I can execute what's called a multi-shard query. And that's gonna do that heavy lifting for me of actually querying all those databases and aggregating the results back together for me so I don't need to worry about running multiple queries. So let's go ahead and just let that run. And if I pop back over to PowerShell here, we'll see the results of the query. And you'll notice under department type here, I have some that are department type three, some that are department type two. So I'm getting data from multiple databases and it's all been folded back together for me. So that's pretty cool. Now, because this application is taking full advantage of uh, the SQL technology uh, in memory, OLTP, uh, that's in SQL, 20, SQL Server 2016 and in Azure SQL Database, we also can build real-time analytics on top of that to get a bird's eye view of what's happening uh, across the city, as well as sort of some historical trends in the data. So now I'm gonna log into the application, this time as a supervisor. And this supervisor has access to this really cool dashboard. And what it allows them to do is see what's happening and they can sort of drill in and get deeper information and insight. So I've got a map here of the most recent incidents, um, you know, which ones were significant, which ones were smaller, which kind of departments responded to those. I can see trends over time. Um, I've even got a dashboard here with some imp additional information that's looking at historical data. And in fact, I've got a word cloud that is looking across police reports and surfacing trends in the, in the words. So you'll notice I've got the word intoxication apparently uh, shows up a lot in these uh, city of Sammamish police reports. So we may have a little bit of an issue here we need to, we need to deal with. Um, so it's good to sort of know those things, right? Um, now what if we could take this just one step further and instead of just seeing trends and historical information, what if we could actually understand what's going to happen? 
Well, now with the power of Azure Machine Learning, every developer has the capability to do just that and build that level of intelligence into your application. So what we've done, and I'm gonna show you here Azure Machine Learning Studio, is we built a model and we've trained this model with years of historical incident data from the city, as well as things like weather data, traffic data, um, you know, calendar information, major events. Um, and that model now has the ability to use current information to predict what might happen in the future. And so with this model, we've actually integrated that right into the application. So I can go back here, and now I have a heat map right inside of my application. And what this is doing is telling me based on current calendar events, current traffic, current weather, all of those different data sources and this historical information, where incidents are most likely to occur. So me as the administrator of all these agencies can actually deploy my resources out into the field where things are likely to happen, and that's ultimately gonna reduce response times and create happier citizens. So what I've shown you today is a fully native application that's, that's fully native across platforms. It's powered by data, it creates a layer of intelligence, and really powered by the Azure Cloud, and every developer in the room now has the capability to really build these types of solutions, taking advantage of the tools and services, Visual Studio and Azure. So thank you very much. Great, right, thanks Craig. So you saw a good integration across all of those, and there's lots of examples of companies that are doing this today. I just want to share a couple with you. Uh, first of all, TalkTalk, Talk, uh, it's one of the largest UK uh, cable providers. And what's interesting, they have 30,000 items more inside of their catalog, so think streaming, video, and TV shows, and it's basically over one and a half petabytes worth of material. And they really need to be able to make sure that they can do real-time streaming to their customers. Uh, in that kind of world, there's no such thing as maintenance windows, right? If you want to watch your show, you want to watch your show. Now, what they've been able to do is actually leverage Service Fabric, which is our microservices framework. Uh, it does auto roll forward, auto roll back, state migration, and full HA, and it does a whole bunch of that stuff for you automatically. Now you can have a microservices architecture. I can actually apply updates live, continue to go, all by having those users be able to browse that catalog of 30,000 items and make sure that things continue to go. So, and then frankly, if there's peak watching periods and things like that, they can scale up their usage on the cloud and scale it back down. Alaska Airlines is also another great example of this, uh, being able to, in this case, do employee-facing applications on multiple devices. And so they were able to leverage Xamarin to go do that build, again, just using very similar interfaces to here. I can go write that application, use the test cloud, and come away with that. That really enabled them to be able to give their employees, in this case, an employee-facing application that works on no matter which device uh, somebody's using. So there's just a couple of good examples, uh, and there's a lot more being able to leverage that tech. I want to shift into our final section here and talk more about some of the technology challenges we have and how we're going to do that with productivity. Uh, in particular, I think a lot of the challenges we're seeing, things are really starting to move fast. Employees now work on average about two times the number of teams uh, that they used to uh, from before. And actually, information overload is a huge problem, too. We're constantly getting inundated with a ton of information. There's studies that basically say 25% of a worker's job during the day is dealing with all of this extra information that's coming through. And no matter what we do, we want to make sure that at the end of the day, as I'm enabling new productivity for people, that I've also make sure I'm taking care of securing my corporate data uh, and making sure I got the right kind of governance on top of all that. So security is absolutely top of mind for us. Now what we've done is we've actually worked across multiple parts of our product. We've actually integrated them together. And so we've worked on creating Windows 10 Enterprise, Office 365, and Enterprise Mobility and Security. And again, they are designed to work together so that we can give you that kind of maximum amount of control. We want to do a combination of allowing workers to be able to use their devices, the devices they love, to go you know, use it in their personal life, but also to make sure, and many of you here are actually responsible for corporate security. We want to also make sure that the data that they have access to for work purposes is also protected and taken care of, even against access dental usage. You don't want somebody taking a, a financial report and accidentally tweeting that on top of the same phone. They're also running Excel on top of. So we've actually built these and integrated very deeply. So scenarios like that, you're actually protected for that. So with those solutions, you and your users can get more done without compromising security. 
Let's go take a look at some of these components here real quick. I'm going to start off with Windows 10 Enterprise. And this is the most secure Windows that we have ever built. It's got new features in it, things like Windows Device Guard and Windows Information Protection that's really designed to bring that experience that you want from a user uh, experience, but also give us, again, the corporate security side of this. So I can use my pen. I can have Cortana. I can have those personal experiences that we want. But at the same time, as we're administering that fleet and making it available for our users and in our data centers, then I've got the extra security controls on the back end. And you can see all sorts of examples on there. We've also worked pretty hard on enabling first and third party device ecosystems there. So you have all sorts of new options to be able to do the collaboration and visualization uh, with Windows 10. And next, of course, we have Office 365, our business productivity suites that are there. And of course, we have uh, an amazing amount of adoption of Office 365. Uh, there's over 80% of the Fortune 500 today is actually using Office 365 to enable you know, product productivity and collaboration. And it's a deep and broad set of workloads. You start off with things like email, you know, Exchange. Obviously, we've got Exchange up and running. It's a core you know, work hearts, a, a part of the system. But also collaboration you know, with voice and video and those sort of things. Shout out for OneNote. I love my Surface Book with pen and OneNote. Uh, awesome combination that we've got there. Uh, in addition to that, it's still built on top of a highly secure, manageable, and extensible service platform, and actually driving at a very high SLA. It's well over the 3.9's SLA that it goes, so it's reliable. I can rely on getting my work done and being able to do the collaboration. Now, there are over 70 million people using Office 365 every single month with this massive growth that's coming through. And so we're very excited about you know, that collaboration that we've got. Now I want to finish us off with enterprise mobility and security. EMS, super important for us because again, getting the productivity is awesome, but I have to be able to secure my system. Now we've actually worked across several critical layers here. There's the user, there's the device that I've got, there's the applications, and there's the data. And we believe it's important that you actually optimize and make sure you've got the right combination of security for all of those. So we've added things in here, like being able to do single sign-on with Azure Active Directory to make it simple to move around. Protecting data, I gave you the example of protecting corporate data, uh, in addition to automatically classifying and encrypting the right kind of data. So again, as I'm using it on my devices, I don't get them mixed up and the applications actually help protect me. We also do advanced threat protection for on-premises and the cloud for advanced trust threat analytics, you saw some examples that Jeff showed from before, and we've got even more in there. Again, crunching petabytes of data, looking for machine learning patterns, and also because we have such a large corpus of users and we see the worldwide everything, botnets, the whole nine yards, then we're able to also rapidly update these environments as that kind of environment changes. So if we see new hacking attacks, new threat vectors, we can actually go automatically update the systems. You don't have to wait for rollouts of patches. We actually do that, make sure we're continuously updating and keeping things things up for you as well. So let's go ahead and look at our last demo today and take a look at productivity and our security work that's here. And I want to introduce Ben. Ben. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. OK. So I'm going to start today um, on the device that we probably all spend a lot of our time on, which is our phone. And, uh, and the reason I want to do that is that this is a device that we tend to work a lot more on now as we're mobile. And I'm going to open up the application that's been heralded as the number one application for mail, which is Outlook. Now, the reason this got touted as the number one application for accessing your mail on any platform, be that Office 365, Gmail, doesn't matter what it is, it's still the best application. And the reason it got that rating is because of great features like swipe gestures, where I can start to triage my email with one hand quickly and easily no matter where I am. Things like a focused inbox that allows me to see the most important email easily and quickly in a focused area while moving all the things that are less important to me to another area. Things like an integrated calendar and file store as well help make this the best application to access my email anywhere. But we've continued to make it even easier for you to work through those messages because we know that you don't just go up there and swipe an email to delete or schedule that. You want to be able to actually process that information easier and quicker on the go. And so I have um, actually have my travel itinerary here for this event. And you'll notice something is that I open up this email. Um, one of the things with travel itineraries and things like uh, order information and those kind of emails, they're kind of hard to process. And the reason is that if I scroll down to this email, you can see here's all my information about my flights and, and what's happening. And I've got to kind of zoom in and see that. And I know the people at the back definitely can't read when my flights are leaving. But what we've done with Outlook is added a new feature called Action Cards that looks at that key information in my email and presents that to me at the top of the message. 
And so I can see here at a glance, just by tapping through there, all of the key information about my flights. I can see when my flight leaves, where it leaves from, where it's going to, and the times. And as I come down, you can see here I have my flights that are leaving tomorrow, and I can actually go right from here and hit the check-in button to open up my Delta application and go and check in from my flight. So making it much easier for me to not only process that information, but take action on it as well, right from my mobile device. Now, I've also um, made it even easier for you to work with other people on your device as well. This here is my uh, agenda view of my calendar, and the first thing you'll notice is that all of my appointments have these icons that are assigned to them. Now, this gives me an at-a-glance view of what's coming through the day and where I'm spending my time. Now, these icons weren't something I assigned. They were things that were assigned by Outlook based on the title and the subject of my meetings and what's happening. And what I'm going to do here is, uh, is one of the things that we all tend to do. I'm going to go and schedule a new coffee meeting here. Um, and you'll notice that Outlook goes and assigns a nice coffee cup, so I know what I'm doing later on. And one of the biggest challenges with uh, scheduling meetings is knowing when everyone's free. And so I'm going to go and schedule this meeting with Pavel, and as I come into here to select a time, you'll notice that we, in real time, go and check back on both mine and also Pavel's calendar. And I can see that currently 11.30 to 12.30, one of us is not available. So all I have to do to find a time that suits both of us is pick up that appointment and just drag and drop that round until it turns green. And like that, I now have an appointment that suits both of us. And I can go ahead and click uh, accept on that and send that message out. And I've managed to secure a time both on mine and Pavel's calendar where we're both available to have that meeting. So reducing the time it takes me to have to go back and forth. Now, we also released a new product recently called Microsoft Teams, a chat-based workspace that allows me to bring people together to work more effectively. And the beauty of this application is that at release, we had applications for both the Windows PC, iPhone, and Android, and across all of the platforms there so that we could work wherever you are on a Teams client. And so as I open up Teams here, you can see this gives me a view of everyone I'm working with and all of the teams I'm working on. I can get a list of the alerts and people who've messaged me and responded to me, my one-on-one -on -one chats, so people who I'm messaging with directly, and then, of course, the teams that I'm a member of as well. But the beauty about this application is, like I said, it's available on every platform. So as I move over to my PC, you'll see that this also, and I'm going to flip this over, um, this also now scales up to a full-blown Windows environment as well. Here is that same experience that I had on my phone available on my PC. In the left rail here, you can see, again, links to my activities and my chats and my teams. But because we're on a, uh, a Windows PC and I now have Skype for Business integrated as well, I can also get access to my meetings. I can see all of the things that are upcoming there and join those, as well as access directly into my file store as well for all of my recent files. Now, I'm going to come back to my Teams view here and give you a quick view of this. So what we have here is a list of all of my teams, and each of my teams has a set of channels. So while I have a group of people working together, it's often that those groups of people have subgroups who are working on different topics within that team. So you can see here I have a graphic design institute where I have people working on an arts and media festival or the social media and PR. And I also have this uh, future ideas channel here that if you look closely, you can see it has a little icon next to it. That indicates to me that there's currently a meetup happening. Now, a meetup is where messages are, I'm, are not quite meeting what I need, and so I can actually go ahead and start to create a, a video call with the people within that group that anyone can jump in and out of. So I'm going to go ahead and join my meetup here. And, uh, and this is going to go and load up and uh, take just a second to connect. And you can see uh, the beautiful Paul and Mira there who look everything like their pictures. Um, Paul's being a little bit slower to join, but that's okay. It looks like he's having network problems. But you'll see what we can do here is I can jump straight into this conversation with Paul and Mira, and I can actually talk to them and, and have that conversation and come and go as I need to really quickly and easily. And everyone give a wave to Mira there as well. All right, so now what we're going to do is I'm going to change gears a little bit, and I'm going to switch over to my uh, Edge browser. And of course, Edge here is running the Windows Defender Application Guard, so the most secure browsing experience that I have no matter what site I'm visiting. And looking now, I actually have the new My Analytics dashboard. One of the things that Jason mentioned is that information overload is a huge problem. It also causes a waste of time when, where we're spending time throughout the day and what we're doing. And My Analytics uses the power of the Microsoft Graph to help combat that problem. You can see here my Fitbit view of where I've spent my time throughout the week. You can see I've spent 18 hours in meetings, 10 in email, 11 hours actually doing my job, um, and then eight hours after work trying to catch up on all the time I didn't get to do my job throughout the week. And at a high level, this is interesting, but it starts to really drive action as I, as I drill down to look at what, where that um, data's coming from and what's making it up. So if I look at my meeting hours, for example, I can see that I've spent 18 and a half hours this week in meetings, and as I look at the top, I can see some of my meeting habits. 
So I can see that I multitask a lot in my meetings, and I'm sure we're all victims of this, where we're in a meeting and we're tapping away on IM, we're trying to catch up on email. But what this indicates is that there are meetings here that I'm potentially not engaged in, and that I could probably start to not attend those meetings as frequently or reschedule those um, to get some of my time back. And to find out which of those meetings are the ones that I'm multitasking in, I simply click View Details, and I can get a breakdown of my meetings throughout the week and the ones that specifically that I'm multitasking in. I can see I've got recurring meetings that I'm really not that focused in. And so it gives me that starting point on where I can claw time back and start to get my own calendar back as well. Now, this is one of the areas that we're using the power of Azure and machine learning and intelligence to help you be more productive. But we're also driving that intelligence right into the Office applications as well. So as I move over to Word here, one of the things that we've uh, built into the Word 2016 client is uh, new updates to help create better content, help you be a better writer. And so you can see here I have uh, a number of different sentences here that contain um, standard misnomers of people and the way they write. Things like wordiness and redundancy, where we have her backpack was very large in size. And I can actually go and uh, right click this and you'll see Word actually goes and considers to use more descriptive verbs in this case to say her backpack was exceptionally large in size. Um, we can also combat things like gender specific language. So we have a sentence here that says the state should hire more policemen. In a world where, and especially in Microsoft, we want to be more gender neutral and more inclusive. If I right click that, Word will actually come through and suggest that I use the, um, that they the state should hire more police officers. And so these are ways that we're starting to assess language and give people better outcomes and help them to be better understood. We're also building intelligence into other areas of Office as well, and specifically here into PowerPoint. And I'm actually going to go and restart this because it seems like the connection drop we had before caused a small problem. Um, and one of the big challenges when we're starting a presentation is how do I get started? Where do I start to, to kind of get past that cold start? And that's where we have a feature called Quick Starter. And Quick Starter takes advantage of all the services in the cloud to help give me a presentation outline and get me going. So I'm going to create a new presentation here on electric cars. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and hit search. And what will happen here is uh, PowerPoint's going to go and talk to the internet, and it's going to come back and ask me, what's the topic I want to use? Is it electric cars? Is it electric cars by country? What's the topic I'm doing my presentation on? For this, I'm going to select electric car. And then we use the Bing Knowledge Graph to return a number of different topics to build my presentation. And so I'm going to come through here and select the things that I want to include in my presentation uh, and go and hit Next. I'll then go and select a look and a feel for my slides, which will take a moment to come back. And then I'll hit Create. And what PowerPoint's now doing is going and talking to the Bing Knowledge Graph to bring me back information about electric cars specifically and the topic of electric cars. And it builds me a full presentation outline to get me started. And so you'll see here, I've got a couple of pointers on the fact that I have a presentation outline. And, uh, and as I come down, it'll give me related topics to research. But then as I get into my presentation, you can see it's pulled full bleed images, table of contents, information on terminology and history. And as I open up my notes area, uh, let's come down to uh, economics here. You'll notice what I get at the bottom here is actual talking points to consider going and looking at as well. And so what this allows me to do is to be able to not only get the full outline, but also gives me the pointers on the areas to research and really gets me started on building that presentation. So these are some of the ways we're using the power of the cloud and intelligence and machine learning to help you be more secure and also work wherever you are and be more productive. With that, I'd like to hand back to Jason. All right, thanks, Ben. I kind of wish I had that when I was back in high school, man. That <laughs> got us up and running a lot faster, wouldn't it? So there's lots, of, there's lots of companies that are actually leveraging this technology. And let me just share you know, one out of this list here. And that's where I know sport you see in the last one. This is basically Formula One racing. And so what they've actually done, you want to talk about IoT. This is an example of grabbing 2.5 billion events in a race from the car going around off the engines and then being able to go back and look at the analytics side of that and how do I go back and tune the vehicle and be able to actually get the next run up and done. Uh, so in that, if you imagine being able to do that, go on the road, hybrid kind of scenarios like that, yeah, that's, that's kind of a super awesome one. We have other examples here as well. Hershey's using Office 365 globally, basically helping pull together multiple teams, uh, using, again, Cortana intelligence as well to optimize, optimize their manufacturing. So you see really great examples of the collaboration with Office 365, this deep analytics, pulling those back in, both through your applications and the intelligent apps that you write as well. Now, 
We've got a lot of really great stuff that's here. And we also want to invest in your career. And here's some really great examples of this. IT Pro Career Center, Cloud Essentials, Microsoft Mechanics, and Microsoft Tech Community. So your peers that are there. Uh, and this is definitely a good one to get a photo of because there's lots of URLs on there if you want to go grab them. We want to make sure, again, your skill sets accrue to this new world that's coming along. But there's also a peer group and resources for you to be able to leverage from. Now, I know that making some of these kind of changes can definitely be, you know, can be a, a new thing. You've got to figure out how to go navigate that. So one of the things I want to do lastly here is to share with you what are some other folks doing in this space and, you know, what does their journey look like? Let's go ahead and roll the video. In the beginning, I was a total skeptic. I was like, why would you want to put your data somewhere else? Before the cloud, some of my peers were reluctant. Is it something that can work for, for me personally, but also for the, the clients I'm advising? IT professionals are always seen as the people who spend money but don't bring any value. And then that kind of changed when the cloud and the evolution of the cloud came into being. We're able to be more responsive as a whole. It's helping IT so we can take on other projects. Before the cloud, I was just trying to keep up with the maintenance of day to day. But now, I'm free to come up with creative ideas. You know, how can our marketing team do more and do it from home and do it from Singapore or China? When you're innovating, you don't want to have barriers. Things have gotten a lot smoother. Less security to worry about, less bandwidth issues. With cloud, you can add on as you go along. No need to invest in the hardware. I see my whole infrastructure remotely on one device, one machine. I can bring up my console and with a few clicks of a button, get a site up and running and then just reach out to the customer and say, hey, can you see it? If I were to get advice, I would say be open to cloud. My company now feels me as a more valued member of the team, coming up with new ideas, innovative ideas. You will see yourself growing tremendously. As important as you are, you could be so much more. Learn as much as you can, expose yourself to what available options you have and take advantage of them. There's lots of great ways for you to be able to join in, including the material we have today. So you can take advantage of the sessions, the hands-on sessions. We also have virtual sessions online, uh, especially helpful for anybody that's watching from a streaming perspective. You can do the test drive and try things out and make sure you get an opportunity to try that. And stick around for the Ask the Experts reception at the end of the day. I love those. I can't talk after it's done, but uh, you ask any question you want. It's just amazing to hear all the projects and things that are doing. Uh, we really love and are excited about that too. So lots of great speakers. Lots of great sessions. I hope you have an awesome conference. Thank you very much.